So let's jump into a little bit about your background. Uh, you, you mentioned in the talk that the Montauk project gets a lot of the hype, but there was more to these uh, time travel programs and than just the Montauk project. Where did it originate from? The um, the U.S. time space program emerged in the mid 1960s mm -hmm. in a project under the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency called Project Pegasus. Pegasus. Okay. Um, I know that it had an operational time travel capability that owed its debt of gratitude to Nikola Tesla because sometime between uh, my September birthday in 1967 and my September birthday in 1968, my father and I teleported from the old Curtis Wright Aeronautical Company facility in Woodridge, New Jersey to Santa Fe and then we drove uh, to a meeting with Dr. Harold Agnew at the Los Alamos National Labs and during that meeting Dr. Agnew asked my father my age and we both answered simultaneously six. So uh, now relative to Montauk that places teleportation about 15 years before the Montauk timeline begins in the books about Montauk by Preston Nichols and Peter Moon. Uh, I can confirm aspects of the Montauk account however for example the individual that they identify as the research director for Project Montauk, uh, namely Jack Pruitt, I know is a real person because I worked with him in Project Pegasus, which he served as a team leader, one of the facilitators on the project. I also know that the Montauk chair exists because beginning in the uh, spring of 1970, I and the other children, there were 140 children, but I and the immediate group of children uh, that I was in the program with, were taking visits to our own subjective future mentally in the Montauk chair. The Montauk chair is a magnetic transducer that bumps your mind forward so you pre-experience subjective moments in your own future. So I can at once state that there was an earlier program that had more advanced time travel technologies as its focus, but also that elements of the Montauk account are quite valid. And so, um, guardedly, I believe that in all likelihood the Montauk project was a spin-off of the Pegasus project focusing on the Montauk chair. Its advantage, of course, was that the chair doesn't go anywhere, nor right. physically does the time travel. And yet they were able to uh, derive reliable intelligence, that is, actionable intelligence about the future. Because they would send your, our minds forward, and let's say we would see ourselves in our home 20 years in the future. And they would ask a question like, well, was the television set on? Yes. What was on the television? Oh, the president was on the television. Who was the president on the television? So by bumping uh, the human mind forward in the Montauk chair, they were able to gather intelligence without all the risks associated with physically sending something there. So I believe that in all likelihood the Montauk project occurred because there's too much data in their account that I can recognize from Project Pegasus. But it was not the inception of the Time Space Program. That occurred about 15 years earlier in the mid-60s under Project Pegasus. And then another one of these projects is the Philadelphia Experiment that we hear about. And we're in Philadelphia. so. Is the Philadelphia experiment uh, a part of this, or do you think that is sort of uh, to disrupt? To, what's that? Well, Tesla was part of the Philadelphia experiment. Tesla was a part of the Philadelphia He intentionally sabotaged it because he knew they were going to use it for evil. Well, um, yeah, in, in answer to your question, um, something like the Philadelphia experiment took place during World War II. Now, my source on this is Dr. Robert Beckwith, who was one of the consulting engineers for Project Pegasus. He would regularly discuss Nikola Tesla and the Philadelphia experiment, for example, when we would take lunch with the project people remember, in New Mexico. In fact, we took most of those lunches at the La Hacienda and the La Placida restaurants in Old Town Albuquerque. In those years, those were the two leading Mexican restaurants in the whole state of New Mexico. And I interviewed him twice uh, in the early 2010s. He was also interviewed separately by Alexander Bruce, the writer, and also by Ken Thomas, the editor of Steam Shovel Press. And in those four uh, interviews, Bob Beckwith, who was then in his 80s, adhered to the facts that he would share when I was a child back in, on Project Pegasus in the early 70s, which is that the Philadelphia Experiment took place. But as Bob told it, the, the Philadelphia Experiment story that's come down to us is essentially a, a disinformational ploy scripted by the Office right. of Naval Intelligence in which all of the critical facts were changed. For example, the name of the ship wasn't the Eldridge, it was the Martha's Vineyard. The experiment didn't take place in the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard, close to where we are here. Right. It, it took place in Long Island Sound. It near Montauk? Near, 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 near Montauk, Long Island. Near Montauk. Yes. Yeah. I thought it was Maryland. No. 
No, no. It, and it, it wasn't. Um, it wasn't undertaken to test radar invisibility of ships. It was an experiment to see whether Tesla teleportation could use, be used to move our naval vessels during World War II. Did it go to when North the Nazi, well, well, it When the Nazi Navy began chaining uh, the, their mines to the bottom of the Atlantic, and it didn't teleport back to. Norfolk, Virginia, it teleported back to Newport News. So what we have here is essentially an urban legend in which the original experiment, the facts of the original experiment were altered. Now why were they altered? They were altered because the original experiment <coughs> established the critical linkage between Tesla, teleportation, and the Los Alamos physicists. When Nikola Tesla died on January 9th of 1943, there were two War Department officials that is, War Department agents and two FBI agents racing to his apartment at the New Yorker Hotel in Manhattan to seize his, his shop manuals, right. his lab notes. Yeah. The two War Department agents arrived first, and this is really from the conventional uh, biographies sure, of sure. Tesla by people right. like Margaret Cheney, for example. The War Department officials got there and forwarded his documents to the people in the world that would make the most sense to send them to, the, the world's most distinguished physicists. People that, you worked with, no? Well, Harold Agnew, certainly as the director of Project Montauk, was somebody who was present during all three critical stages of the Manhattan Project. He was in the squash courts at the University of Chicago when the atomic pile were critical. He was in Los Alamos and Alamogordo when the atomic bomb was designed and tested. And he was even uh, in the chase plane that was following the Enola game when it dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima a plane called the Great Artiste, and he was calibrating the magnitude of the blast. So Tesla's papers went to the physicists that were then gathering in the 1943-44 uh, time frame in Los Alamos to build the atomic bomb. And so because that established where Tesla's teleportation technology went, and where, I might add, it still is, Tesla's documents are at the Los Alamos National Laboratories. They had to script a cover story after World War II to conceal that fact, and that is the Philadelphia Experiment cover story that's come down to us involving the Eldridge and so forth. Sure, and we see History Channel documentaries on the Philadelphia Experiment, and of course they won't talk about the various aspects of the real gist of the program. Now, when you say that Correct. you've been, you've teleported, now a lot of people out there may, who are not open-minded, may roll their eyes. What does that consist of, though? I mean, is it, uh, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know that I've wrapped my head around what it means to teleport. Obviously, there's the Star Trek version, but it, when you say you, you, there's this teleportation technology, what do you mean by that? The teleportation technology, based on the hidden works of Nikola Tesla that were classified during World War II, involves propagating a field of radiant energy. Radiant energy is a natural energy that is latent and pervasive in the universe that Tesla discovered a way to tap from the physical universe. And this is the same thing that posed a threat to our electrical grid, because with this sort of thing, a lot of people talk about free energy. That, when you can tap into this source, that's unlimited energy, and the powers that be cannot control. Yes. Am I right here? Space is extremely dense with energy. In fact, one cubic meter of space contains as many ergs of energy as there are grains of sand on all of the beaches on planet Earth. So yes, this was an inherently, uh, an inherently disruptive technology because it would make energy essentially entirely abundant and free. And so what Tesla discovered is a way to harness that energy so that when you create an array of radiant energy and a teleportee jumps through that curtain of energy, it is so dense with energy that the fabric of time space is essentially tunneled through and the teleportee moves through what's called a mortal tunnel in the fabric of time space. But when that tunnel ends when, when that opening in the time space continues. And what does this look like? What does this tunnel phys physically look like? Does it look like, you know, uh, something we would see in the movies or? It, it looks somewhat like the illuminated tunnel that people report in the near-death experience. It was essentially triangular in shape and sort of an oblate triangle. Of course, the fundamental geometry of the time space continuum involves three, three lines. And so it wasn't the perfect tunnel, it was an imperfect oblate tunnel. And when we jumped through the Tesla device, which was at the old Curtis Wright Aeronautical Company facility in Woodbridge, New Jersey, that's where they had set up one of the technologies that they found in Tesla's papers uh, during the war. And they experimented with it. Uh, initially, they didn't know what that particular device did. But one of the men working, one of the technicians working at that shop, walked through the field of rain and energy that the device propagated and to get a screwdriver across the shop floor and he spontaneously teleported to Africa. 
when he returned to the shop six weeks later, his supervisor actually collapsed because he thought he had been disintegrated by the field of energy. But he came back. But he came back. In fact, he had been displaced in, in, the, in time space to Africa. And then, I guess, dealt with the Africans. So, that, that so in addition came home. To, to being transported through these, um, uh, what did you call them there? That, that was basically called a Tesla energetic array. In fact, my late father, Raymond F. Shago, he was an engineer for the Ralph M. Parsons Company, which was the defense contractor that played the leading role in giving the U.S. government time travel. Once showed me a classified lab manual where one of these elliptical-shaped Tesla teleportation devices was called a Tesla energetic array. And in fact, even science fiction directed at children during that era contains disinformation because if you go to Madeline L'Engle's uh, yeah, uh, uh, children's, time. Uh, children's yeah. time travel. Sure, I've, I read the book as did many children. And Correct. She, she describes the device using an acronym for Tesla Energetic Array. She calls it a Tesseract. Inter yeah, Whoa. that's right. right, right. No. So, and, I, and I, reading that book, you always... So presumably I'm yeah, telling very, the truth. Wow. Very cool stuff. <laughs> very cool stuff. Wow. Uh, now, <laughs> I read that book ten times, but... Yeah. Well, very there you have it. I now, love that There was some Tesla technology hidden in Sure. I, I think. Very, very interesting. Uh, Andrew, back to the time travel aspect of this, though. In, in your talk, which okay. I'm sure everyone will have to watch once they hear our little interview here, uh, you talked about being traveling in time to also to the future and the past. Correct. And you even uh, were in the presence of Abraham Lincoln at some point. Well, uh, that's not entirely I was, I was involved in a time probe in which the effects were paraphysical where a hologram was propagated in the laboratory where the events of Lincoln's time, I'm, I'm talking now about when they were sitting in the Ford's theater, get behind his box and try to see Hey guys, we're not going to get out <coughs> Yeah, I think so. All right, back, let's back up again. Uh, speaking of, sure, yeah. Uh, in reference to time travel, there there's all sorts of experiences you had, and, and one had to do with Lincoln, in which there was an actual picture that you were included in. You want to tell us a little bit more about right. that? That, that? That visit to the past uh, was effectuated by uh, plasma confinement. I entered a plasma confinement chamber. Uh, this technology was pioneered by Dr. Sterling Colgate when he was the chair of the physics department at the, at the New Mexico Institute of Science and Technology, UMIST, UN MIST, excuse me, NM MIST. Now um, Colgate, that's the same as the toothpaste, right? Yes, he was a scion of the Colgate Palmala fortune, which donated the funds to the launch project Pegasus in the mid to late 1960s under DARPA. And uh, he developed a technology that involves the, the, the time traveler walking into a field of plasma under confinement. Uh, and you are relocated to a past event. But then when that localized quantum field effect wears off, you find yourself back in the plasma confinement chamber. And uh, in the spring of 1972, I drove up to a time lab in East Hanover, New Jersey, that Dr. Colgate from New Mexico Tech was present at. I remember we had a brief discussion about the fact that I said, Dr. Colgate, what are you doing here? Because I had encountered him in New Mexico. And he said, Andy, the, the adults on the project are teleporting too. Okay. And uh, they, my dad asked me a question, basically, that, that consternated me, or even frightened me. He said, do you want to go back um, to November 19th of 1863 and see Abraham Lincoln get the Gettysburg Address? Now, I had previously seen Lincoln at Ford's Theater when I was sent to Lincoln's time, the time of the American Civil War, uh, via uh, chronovisor. But that was a paraphysical form of time travel based on holography. This form of time travel, as it was explained to me, would physically send me there, just as teleportation can physically send you somewhere. The problem with teleportation, of course, is you don't want to be teleported before the time of the existence of the teleport, or you're not getting on to your present. So this device was developed to create a local effect around the teleportee that then wore off and you spontaneously came back to the present. And so I was standing there in this time lab in East Hanover, and I basically didn't answer my father. It just seemed a pretty fearsome prospect to be literally standing in front of Abraham Lincoln as he gave and how old were you? address. In the spring of 1972, I was 10. 10 years old. And I actually was thinking of that famous photograph of Abraham Lincoln taken in 1863 by Alexander Gardner, where he basically is looking forward, you know, with his eyes burning like coals. And he looks basically like a, ch like a chimpanzee sure. in, a, in a starch suit. There was just something intimidating about actually standing at his feet while he stood on the, do the dais there at Gettysburg and gave his famous Gettysburg address. So I initially balked and said, no, I, I don't think I want to do that. 
Then Dr. Colgate said to my dad, well, why don't we give Andy a couple weeks and we'll come back here and we'll ask him the same question. Now, they had to do that, I later learned, when I was actually sent to Gettysburg on the day Lincoln gave the address, because my father had previously been sent there via the same technology, in other words, on a previous day, and had encountered me there at an older age than I was, than I was, quote unquote, back at the house, back at our home in Mars Plains, New Jersey. And so uh, they had to get me on track to implement the, that particular outcome, which was to go there as well. In fact, my, da my dad later observed when I discussed that, that, that jumped with him, that quantum leap. Uh, he said, yeah, that was when I first learned that you were going to be on the project. <coughs> Excuse me. Because I went there and you walked up and said, Dad, what are you doing? Um, so that technology basically involved walking into a field of plasma, which is under confinement, in a kind of a lucite chamber that looks sort of like a squash court, like a handball court, racquetball court at a, at a, at a, at a fitness club. And we walked into the roiling cloud of beautiful neon colors of the plasma. And then when I did that, I, I suddenly found myself basically tumbling through one branching wormhole after the other. In fact, that was the only time travel technology that I was exposed to when I was a child on Project Pegasus, where there was literally wormholing. So I was moving through the amber color. And are you physically walking? Is this... No, I, I walked in the... In the and then you feel yourself chamber. moving through it? Is Are you being... Well, I walked into the field of plasma, and I, the bottom fell out from underneath me, and I began just tumbling through these branching, sort of cascading wormholes in the quantum plenum, which is this amber-colored medium that exists between dimensions. And then I popped into view in the location... <coughs> pardon me. In the location that my dad had described back at the time lab in East Hanover. At that time, there, were, there was a north-south arterial that went through Gettysburg and another road that went off to the northwest. And my dad took a map, it was actually a mimeograph of an historical map, and said, we're going to put you down right here next to the road to the northwest of the main north-south road that goes through Gettysburg. And we know they were there in 1863 because they're still there. And so after tumbling through the quantum plenum and all these wormholes, I basically appeared there on the side of the road, and yet I, I knew that I had to take action to correct what had happened. But what happened in those wormholes is my hat had been wrenched off. I had been dressed as a Union Bugle boy. So they actually blended. dressed you to look yes. as if you were uh, <coughs> natural in that time. Yes, when we went back to the time lab, my dad and I, and I, he asked me the same question with Dr. Colgate standing there. I said, sure, Dad, I'll go. I mean, it's a great opportunity to see such, a, a, such an historical event. And he said, okay, Valerie will dress you to go there. And so I went to this local dressing room, or you know, adjacent dressing room there, and she must have had about, I don't know, 200 historical costumes. And um, she said, Andy, I'm going to dress you as a Union Bugle Boy, just so you sort of blend into the social environment. But I can't give you a bugle son because I see on your file here you don't play the trumpet, you play the alto saxophone. <laughs> and I said, that's right, so I don't want to carry a trumpet. Plus, a trumpet is metal. And on many of these time probes, we couldn't bring metal, at least metal that was magnetic, because that produces electrostatic discharge in these kinds of wormholes that are opened up by the Tesla devices. <coughs> in this case, uh, the plasma confinement chamber. So she said, so I can't give you trumpets. You're going to have to explain to anybody you meet why you're a bugle boy without a bugle. So it was a spanking brand new uniform with a hat, this dark blue jersey, these pantaloon pants, and some spanking brand new black shoes, dress shoes. But when I got to, got to Gettysburg in 1863, there by the side of the road, I realized that my hat and my shoes and one of my socks had been wrenched off as a result of the violence inside the wormhole that had occurred. So I sat down, took my other sock off, and threw it in the bushes because we were trained extensively to avoid basically detection, to avoid being noticed, uh, to avoid being conspicuous when we were time traveling to a particular location. Now, is that because you, we, you know how people often ask uh, if there is time travel, which seems based on your accounts that there is time travel. If you go back in time uh, and change something, then that will have an effect. So in other words, can you change the history? No. No. Let me explain why. When you travel back in time um, and you do something, you're doing it in that present. And then that action is taken forward and becomes history from the perspective of the present of our present. 
Okay, so we're, we are in the present right now, though, right? I'm just checking. Well, the causes that have created the present are the forces of the past. If you time travel at any point during the, any time during the existence of the time-space continuum back to a previous time and affect the causation of that time, that moving forward in time leads to the effects in the present, then you did it back then, and you, those, those conditions already exist. So all you can do when you try, time travel to the past is fulfill an open loop of causation that was exi that existed in the past, but that then gets fulfilled by you as a time traveler from the future in the present, it sent, and, and it has already sent that causation forward. So I, I want to let you finish the talk about, because uh, I, I know you have more about uh, this story uh, specific with the Lincoln, but uh, I also want to, after we, we finish with this, understand the motives behind this sort of time travel. You know, a lot of people feel that this is a part of the Illuminati or some black ops, and you mentioned during your talk that you received a certain abuse and mind control techniques. Well, from they them. tried to make us adhere to the secrecy regime, cooperate with what we were told to do and not talk about it. Well, that's the best way to get somebody to keep a secret is that trauma-based mind control. Well, uh, that's, that's a fraughted term. Yeah. That didn't happen. Sure. Um, we were subjected to different forms of abuse that basically uh, caused us to have enough fear and be intimidated enough to do what we were being told. It was also an attempt to brainwash me after my experiences. So it wasn't trauma-based mind control of the sort that implies that the individual is placed under entrainment. In fact, we were given extensive training to act authentically when we were time traveling, not to act as mind-controlled assets who do what we were entrained to do. So it wasn't really mind control. I would call it, you know, brutal training, which many soldiers experience during their basic training. In other words, just to basically buck up and take orders from in what was ultimately a military intelligence project um, and basically not reveal the existence of the project. And then after I had my time travel experiences in, uh, at the end of the summer of 1972, there was an attempt to make me forget what had happened. But we were never placed under mind control, which beyond those, um, those forms of, tr of tr or ways of treating somebody, implies that somebody becomes a mature candidate right. who is an instrument of agency for the will of other people. That never happened. That we basically had the hell scale when we were on the project to just understand that we were in a very sensitive, compartmentalized, national security related program that the Department of Defense had undertaken and that the survival of our country depended on. And now why have you decided to come out is the next question, I guess. I made my first attempts to reveal what was going on when I was a child on the project. Yeah, at six years old, you said, or, or maybe it was in... Uh, well, at nine. Nine, you right. called, you actually called or tried to alert the authorities about this. Well, I... I I'm, I'm mixing I, up with... Uh, I'm, I'm well, getting, no, I, I, I called my mother from New it Mexico. On? Yeah. Uh, you weren't in for I left a note in the Baton Memorial Building and kind of teleported to New Mexico. I left a toy at one of the project locations in Lamy, New Mexico. Um, I, I basically began the process of disclosing or trying to create some physical evidence for the existence of the program, primarily because I wanted others to know. And I also wanted to go back to New Mexico as an adult and prove these far out experiences I was having actually happened. Yeah. So I left physical evidence there of several forms. I'm speaking out now and I've been you know, investigating what happened to me for 10 years because I believe that the emergence of time travel in the U.S. defense technical community in the late 1960s was one of the great accomplishments of our American civilization uh, of the 20th century. I think it was an epochal set of developments. I also think that some of the technologies that were developed, for example, Tesla teleportation, that is to say perfected in the project, uh, are, are technologies that we're going to need to achieve sustainability in the 21st century. So I'm speaking out as an environmental lawyer uh, and, and as, a, as a figure in the truth movement, because I believe that humanity is going to be needing these technologies to solve the crisis of environment and development in the coming years. And, and so that's why, um, that's why I'm breaking with my secrecy, uh, the secrecy oath that I signed as an eight-year-old in the fall of 1969. Of course, you know, children lack the capacity to contract, so I'm, I'm not bound 
presently by any promise that I made as a kid in the project. But I am speaking out because I believe that we need to reconcile our view of reality with the information that's been kept back from us because it's been concealed all these years under the umbrella of official state secrecy. And the intent, is it sinister or is or maybe there was some good intentions involved with trying to you know, use this technology? Well, if we look at two of the principal technologies, teleportation and chronovision, on the positive side, teleportation holds the potential to revolutionize transportation across the face of our planet. Imagine, you know, let's say a, a plane ride from uh, London, England to Sydney, Australia takes 24 hours. Imagine being able to travel that distance in several seconds. Imagine being able to jump through a Tesla teleporter uh, at Grand Central Teleport in New York City and arrive at Union Teleport in Los Angeles in several seconds. We have the, uh, the capacity, and we've had it for 40 years, to revolutionize transportation if we declassify and deploy Tesla-based teleportation. The opening up of vortal tunnels of the time-space continuum through which we travel. On the negative side, the negative potentiality of teleportation is what has happened, which is that it will remain a military secret. As Donald Rumsfeld said when I was a child on the project, he gave a talk to us at, at, Suri, at the Suria to, to the project. Donald Rumsfeld gave about a half hour lecture to about 20 children on the project at the Surreal's Cultural Center site. There was an underground amphitheater there. You can see it from the surface there because there was a fire that burned off the roof of the subterranean meeting place location. And he said, and I'm quoting him directly, he said to the children on the project, the principal purpose of the teleportation technology that we're working with is military. It will allow us to put troops precisely where they're needed on the battlefield. So that really is the hidden history of U.S. time travel. It's been sequestered as a military secret. Now, in terms of the chronovision technology, these electro-optical devices that they have developed to propagate a hologram in which you can see a past or future event or experience being there by standing inside the hologram. The positive potentiality of that is that there will be a revolution in science and learning when you can go to the museum or the library and not, all, not just see a painting of George Washington but see a hologram of him crossing the Delaware or, or presiding at the signing of the U.S. Constitution on September 17th of 1787 right here in beautiful historic Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The negative side of this chronological technology, what Dan Burrish referred to as the looking glass technology in his disclosures to Project Campbell. He called it the looking glass technology. Right, look, this looking glass technology that emerged during this time when Project Pegasus was active, um, is that that will form um, the surveillance technology of the police state, of the U.S. government will be allowed to implement a, an oppressive 24-hour surveillance state in the sense that they won't just have technology that they can park outside your house and see what you're doing. Yeah, we heard about the world. radiation and from that sort of technology. It goes beyond that, doesn't well, it? Well, imagine if the, the U.S. government had, the federal government had the power to park a van outside your house and see what you were doing in your house five years ago or what you will be doing in your house five years from now. Uh, this, this theme has been uh, treated in feature films. Minority Report. For, yeah, for example, Minority Report. I mean, really, our civil liberties are in danger, not just as a result of a police state wielding advanced surveillance technologies, but wielding surveillance technologies that will allow and, and do allow the federal government to perform quantum access to past and future events. I can't think of, think of anything potentially more oppressive than, than, than a, a government utilizing time travel technologies to be able to surveil you on a non-linear basis. And so I'm speaking out to, to emphasize uh, both the positive uh, opportunities and the negative constraints or threats that are represented by the time travel technologies that emerged in the U.S. defense technical community 40 years ago. And is it evil? Well, is it, on, is it uh, in the hands of evil? Is more well. I mean, I would leave the that technology up. unto itself is neither good nor evil. It's just the technology. well. I think it's evil that the technology has been concealed, mm -hmm. in the sense of holding back teleportation from the mass public. As I said, it will revolutionize transportation. Instead of uh, driving somewhere with four thousand pounds of metal strapped around our waist with a device called a seat belt in your car, we'll be able to basically leave any of our possessions at the teleport that we can't take through the, the tunnel in the time-space continuum and get all over the surface of the planet in seconds. That's going to be inherently liberating for the human race. 
Um, I think it's also evil to hold back surveillance technologies that com have the potential to completely obviate privacy and personal liberty. And so, yes, I mean, it has an evil potential, but I'm also speaking out regarding the positive potential, because under a beneficent government, under, for example, an activist president who would end the time travel cover-up, we're going to be able to implement the positive potentials of these technologies and craft legislation to protect the American people and the people of the world from the negative potentials of these technologies. Well, I think it's great, and I think this is another example of how we have this potential, but yet we've been suppressed and held back. And it, it's not because we don't have the ability to move beyond oil and those sorts of energy, you know. There's, I, you know, I think there's no limit to what the human species can achieve on planet Earth in the 21st century. I mean, the significance of the emergence of time, space travel, and this was uh, emphasized by Dr. William Shockley, who was then, in the early 70s, he was the chief technical consultant for the U.S. Army. And I and about eight or nine of the other children met Dr. Shockley at one of the project locations in New Jersey. It wasn't Bell Labs where he returned to from Silicon Valley uh, in California in early 72. It was just one of the other uh, time travel uh, sites that we were frequently at. He was there be actually being given a tour. And he thanked us. He was really the only adult in the project to thank us to directly for our participation. He said, you know, you children have been given a great privilege, which is to assist this government in the successful development of time-space travel uh, as young people, as children. And he says, the reason that we launched the time travel program secretly uh, as a, par a, a program that is paralleling the space program that you've all heard so much as children in the Gemini uh, is that it is that we understood when we when we evaluate the benefit of space travel that space travel allows us to explore a location in the universe mm -hmm. at the time that the spaceship reaches that location but it it doesn't give us access to everything that's occurred in that location the time space continuum for every time, every moment that has existed or will exist in the future. And I think that was really a brilliant insight of his, that the significance of time travel technology is it makes the entire cosmos available to human exploration. And I think that's a very positive development. And that's what I think maybe the principal reason why I'm speaking out. Very good stuff. Now, real quick, John Teeter, are you familiar with his account? Yes. What do, you, what do you think about that? Is there aspects of that that are true? and? Because I mean, there's I a lot of debate, you know, John Teeter is this sort of right. ominous I, I've avoided discussing other uh, time travel right. um, proponents, if, if you will, uh, because I'm not trying to convince others of my truth or set myself up as a judge or critic of other people's accounts. I'm simply standing in my own truth and telling it. But I can offer this insight about the John Teeter story, and that is I was intensively involved in Project Pegasus beginning in that first jump to Santa Fe from Woodridge, New Jersey with my dad in the 1967-68 time frame. And then I was, you know, we were in we were in our learning lab that was used to facilitate our time travel experiences on Monday, Tuesdays, and Thursdays of the entire school years uh, from 1969 to 72. And for me, that was the third, fourth, and fifth grade. I was exposed to seven different forms of quantum access during those three years. I spent four hidden summers in New Mexico, the summers of 70, 71, 73 accessed from fall of 71, and then the summer of 72, involved in project activities in New Mexico before teleporting back to New Jersey, arriving on the afternoon of the day we had originally embarked for uh, New Mexico. So, so do you age the same in that? Yeah, you age in the ordinary diurnal okay. way when you're displaced in time space. Because once you slow down and get there... And does it have an effect on your health when, you, when you're put through this? <coughs> One of the things we knew it was doing then, and we're certain now that it, the impact that it had, is it was causing pretty profound dehydration. So um, you, I guess you prepared for that after you learned that, or did they not Right, care? and some of the teleportees are developing a disease that mimics the effects of, of, of diabetes, and that's another reason I'm speaking out, so that they can confront their project memories and and take appropriate medical measures. Um, uh, well, I lost my train of thought. On, uh, uh, we were talking about uh, John Teeter a little bit. Right, okay, right. Picking up on John Teeter. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, regarding the John Teeter case, I can offer, actually, you want to, uh, how about I say, if I say however, and you can cut this Sure, there. sure. However, I can offer this insight. insight. Break. All this is added in bulk. Okay, so. okay. Cut. Okay. However, I can offer this insight about the John Teeter story, is that after being exposed to those seven forms of time travel technology, the, the device he describes bears no semblance to any device I've ever had contact with. And so, if you're talking about time travel, it's effectuated, at least physical time travel, through advanced technologies. His technology seems to be a schematic from some other technical device. Another problem that I have with his account, if in fact he's a real person. Which we don't know. In evidentiary terms, yes. In, in, in evidentiary terms, evidence is not deemed reliable if you can't link it to the person who is alleged to have, that makes sense. To have developed it, generated it, led to it. Now he's made a set of claims that may constitute evidence. <coughs> he's made a set, set of claims. Yeah, John Teeter has made, has made a set of claims. Mm -hmm that suggests that he's a real person and that he time traveled from sometime in the 2030s back to what, the mid 70s mm -hmm. and then stayed here for a while and then went home. Right. But we don't know who John Teeter is. So in addition to this technology being something that I don't recognize, we have no John Teeter. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's trouble. The other thing that I... Uh,